Most people think the negotiation is about this little blue triangle up here, the facts. But it turns out that more than half of the, that less than 10% of the reason why people reach agreements has anything whatsoever to do with the facts. More than half has to do with whether the people like each other, trust each other, and most of the rest is how they talk to each other, what tools they use. And if you think that this little blue triangle is a negotiation, sadly, you're going to be right more than you're persuasive. There's a lot of controversy today about facts and fake facts. In my view, this is just an inelegant way of saying that the facts don't really matter. In fact, studies show that if people like you, they will believe what you say, even if what you say is false. If people dislike you, they will tend not to believe what you say, even if what you say is true. It is aggravating for many, I'm sure, that the truth is dependent, not objective, but that's the world that we live in. So, so I know a lot of people, they focus on the facts. Finance people, engineers, you take college boards, you get grades. But when people try to get into colleges, when they try to get uh, uh, customers, customers care mostly about how you are as an individual. Do they like you? Do they trust you? Here is the conventional wisdom in negotiation and what it replaces. The conventional wisdom, law and economics research from the 1970s, focuses on power, leverage, logic, rationality, walkouts, win-win, threats, arms length transactions, game theory, and so forth. And if you think that's all right, try doing your job with 40-year-old tools. This model is based on psychology research that began in the 1990s and continues today on emotional intelligence, perceptions, and cultural diversity. And it generates four times as much value. Twice as many deals, with each deal getting twice as much, for two reasons. Number one, if you understand their perceptions, you're more likely to have, if you, I'm sorry, if you understand their perceptions, you've got a better starting point for persuasion. And second, if you value their perceptions, they're more likely to go along with you. So that the right answer to the statement, I hate you, I hate your country, I hate your religion, I hate your politics, is tell me more. This is an information collection system on the human psyche, more information, more value, so that it is persistently collaborative. It's also persistently fair, is that I love you to death, why is this fair? Knowing their perceptions also makes you much more able to separate friends from enemies. It hasn't been the case for a long time that affiliations equals perceptions. Well, this is an important idea. Try to absorb it. Two Muslims in Saudi Arabia may have less in common with each other than one of them does with a white Christian in Alabama. Two people from Beijing or Shenzhen or Shanghai in China may have less in common with each other than one of them does with somebody in France. It hasn't been the case for a long time that affiliations equals perceptions. So saying all Chinese are the same, all Americans are the same, is just stupid. It doesn't comport at all with the, not with the research. So the statement, how do I negotiate with the Americans, how to negotiate with the Japanese, again, is a stupid question. You're not negotiating with hundreds of millions of people. You're negotiating with one person who may or may not be the same as the stereotype. 
So when you see on the news, the French think this and the Chinese think that, the commentators have no idea, no clue about what really goes on in human interaction. I want to give you some examples of how this model plays out and, and you can see what I mean. About two and a half years ago, I gave this model to the Colombian government to help them negotiate their agreement in Colombia with the FARC terrorism group, ending 50 years of terrorism, the longest terrorism in the Western Hemisphere. Now, I remember the first day I talked to them in the Pentagon in Washington at the request of the Colombians and the Americans, and I met with the senior military officials of Colombia, and I went over the model that I just went over with you, and the chief military officer of Colombia, he piped up and he said, the terrorists, they have to give back their weapons. I said, no they don't. He said, what should we do? I said, lunch. Lunch first, weapons later. <laughs>